the countries surrounding the beautiful Aegean Sea, Turkey, and Greece are exotic and mysterious enough all by themselves, but even more so when you realize the Christians in these ancient cities were the people to whom the exotic and mysterious Book of Revelation was written. The more you know about these ancient cultures of the past, the more you'll discover that will encourage you in your present and future. My name's Renee. I'm one of the pastors at a place called Twin Lakes Church in Santa Cruz, California. And a group from our church visited the seven ancient sites mentioned in Revelation chapters two and three. And in this series, I want to decode that often obscure part of scripture by giving you a virtual travelogue of these places. You will discover principles in these words from Jesus that will encourage you no matter what problems you're facing today. The book of Revelation was written by the last living apostle of Jesus, John, when he's an old man exiled to the island of Patmos, about 50 miles off the coast of modern Turkey. The Romans tried to kill John by boiling him in hot oil, according to some accounts, but he didn't die, and so they banished him when he was an old man to this island. And he writes the book of Revelation. To a lot of people, the book of Revelation is mysterious and scary, filled with prophecies about Armageddon and destruction. But really, it's meant to reveal to us the truth about Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, John writes, When I saw him, Jesus, I fell at his feet as though dead. And then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. What he's saying is this, you're afraid of Rome putting you to death, but Rome did put me to death. I was dead and now I'm alive and I hold the keys of death. You do not have to be afraid. And then Jesus gives John seven letters to seven churches. These are churches that if you traveled clockwise from Ephesus, you would get to each in order. There was an ancient, you could call it Pony Express route that the Persians originally designed to go in these seven churches in a loop in the same order that they are in the book of Revelation. It's fascinating to get to know the history of these cities and then look at the things Jesus says to them because they make so much more sense. As you'll see, knowing the history just opens up these scriptures. But it's easy to leave these letters in the past and say, wow, that was great encouragement for those Christians almost 2,000 years ago. What's amazing to me is how these same words applying to these churches apply directly to all of us, to Christians today because we face the same pressures, pressures to compromise our theology, pressures to compromise our behavior, pressures to make our Christian activity equal our love for Christ. And the first letter that Jesus gives to the Apostle John is a letter to the church at Ephesus. We are on a hill high above the ancient city of Ephesus. You see the big theater at Ephesus right behind me. And we are in a series in the book of Revelation looking at the seven letters of Jesus Christ to seven churches of Asia Minor in Revelation chapters two and three. And the first of those letters was addressed to the church in the first century right here at this city, the city of Ephesus. Revelation two, one through seven. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write this. Now the word translated here, angel, actually simply means messenger. It could be a heavenly kind of angelic being, but personally, I believe it has the other meaning of oiangelios, which could simply be translated messenger. Take this message to the messenger of the church at Ephesus. And he says, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, he who walks among the seven golden lampstands, and these seven stars are the angels of the churches, whether human or supernatural. They're the caretakers of the churches. Jesus is saying, I am still taking care of my church and its leaders, even though I'm not there physically. 
And you'll notice the church here is referred to as a lampstand. We're not the light, we're a lampstand that holds up the light. We lift the light high, we talk about Jesus, we show the love of Jesus, or do we? Let's go on and see what else he says to the church at Ephesus. As in all these letters, he has some commendations and some criticisms. Verse two, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you haven't grown weary, but I have this against you. And here comes the criticism. You have forsaken your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And yet this you have, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So he says, first, they serve faithfully. These are people who work hard. These are people who volunteer their time. Secondly, he says, you have endured hardship. There were some 50 gods and goddesses that were worshiped here in Ephesus. So there was lots of opposition. In fact, the Ephesians had one of the seven great ancient wonders of the world, the Temple of Artemis. It was three to four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens, roughly the size of a soccer field. And there was a whole industry built around tourism to this place. The people who made little souvenirs of the shrine of Artemis really couldn't stand the Christians and they opposed them. In Acts chapter 19, they almost killed Paul in a riot. And so Jesus recognizes this and says, you have endured hardship. And then third, he says, you have sound doctrine. So they're not heretics. They don't have false doctrine. They're not reading crazy books. Imagine how powerful false teaching must have been here in Ephesus with, with all the people who were involved in all of the cults there, not to mention the cult uh, of the emperor. Now, if you were to get a letter like this from Jesus in your church on Sunday, if I were to stand up in my church and say, guess what, good news, I've literally got a letter from Jesus from heaven, and we know this is from Jesus because it's written in red ink, and if I were to say, listen to what Jesus says, and Jesus says, you guys are faithful. He says, you guys are doing all the right things. I love your good works. And Jesus says, your doctrine is perfect. You're, you're not missing a thing. You'd probably think, man, we got it made. I mean, Jesus says we're faithful. Jesus says we're doing the right things. Jesus says we're thinking the right thoughts. Jesus says we don't give up and quit. Man, what else is there to being a Christian than doing the right thing, thinking the right thing, and not quitting? Well, Jesus goes on to say what is missing. Watch what he says next. You have left your first love. He's saying, you know, you check every box, but I know your heart. When you started, there was a lot of love in your church, love for each other, love for lost people, love for me. And now they're just sort of busy and goal oriented and not being swept away by a love for Jesus. And you know what? Maybe this could be you. Maybe you're not a heretic, you're not a false teacher, you haven't walked away from God, you haven't stopped giving, serving, studying. But what about your passion? What about your first love for Jesus and for each other? What I love about Jesus here is that he doesn't just go to guilt and say, you need to do more. He doesn't say, you know, hell's hot, turn or burn. First, he says, here's what I appreciate about you guys. Here's what you're getting right. You're serving faithfully. You've, your doctrine is great. You're working hard. I see that. I appreciate it. I love you. But that being said, Christianity is not a mere to-do list. It's really all about our love for God and our love for one another. What did Jesus say was the most important command? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And doctrine and good works and serving faithfully, really those are meant to be kind of the sides of the pyramid, so to speak, leading to the point. And the point of it all is love. And that's what the church here at Ephesus was missing. So what's the prescription? How do I recover my passion? Well, what does Jesus say here? He says, repent and do what you did at first. Do what you did to recover love? Yeah, that's actually pretty good advice, even to married couples. 
An older, wiser pastor once told me to give this advice to, say, middle-aged couples who are finding that their marriage is becoming passionless, kind of they're losing their zest for each other. He said, tell them to do the things they did at first. Bring flowers, give gifts, write little love notes, go out on dates again. Because if you start treating each other that way, you're, you're not going to be able to help developing some of those original feelings again. And really, that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. You know, there's an old saying, you don't feel your way into action, you act your way into feeling when it comes to love for one another. You don't feel your way into an action, you act your way into a feeling. And he's saying, do the things you did at first. You know, when you were a new Christian, you love to maybe share with other people things you were discovering out of the Word. You love to maybe sing worship songs in the car. You love to just sit on a hillside and think thoughts about the love of God. And Jesus is saying, if you do some of the things you did at first, then you'll find your passion is coming back. The reason really you became a Christian and were attracted to Christ in the first place. And then he says, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And that's apparently a reference to something of the temple of Artemis. She was the goddess of fertility, and in her temple was a tree that was called the tree of life. In fact, the whole temple from prehistoric times had been built around this sacred tree, and her followers would come to touch the tree of life. Maybe women hoping to get pregnant would come to touch the tree because it was a symbol of hope and promise and fertility. And criminals would go there as a place of refuge. If they touched the tree, they could not be executed for even the worst crimes. Literally to them, it was a tree of life. Well, Jesus says, I will give you the tree of life. There is refuge and promise and hope and fruitfulness awaiting you. Even if you are guilty of the worst kind of sin, even if you feel your tree never bore fruit, he says, I have a tree of life and hope and refuge and fruitfulness for you. So where are you in your love for Jesus? Is the busyness maybe even of your faith distracting you from your passion for Christ and for each other? Uh, where do you need to restore the passion to your spiritual life? How can you do that? Think on these things as you consider Christ's words to the church here at Ephesus.